It is definitely true that God is talked about in the Bible as being one God with three distinct persons. So in the insert, you'll find a sort of primer on what the Trinity is as drawn out from a variety of scriptures, including the Gospel of John, the book of Genesis, the book of Daniel, the epistles of Paul, and much more. Please review that because it does matter that we know the truth about who God is so that we can live out the life that he has revealed for us in his Son. And part of the life is found in our text today. So take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and let's read together the Holy Word of God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being done, or were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds, proceeds to all as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and having goodwill toward all the people. Every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. May God bless to our hearts this reading of his holy word. In theaters right now, there is a movie entitled Church People. In the movie, Guy Sides, known as America's Youth Pastor, finds himself at odds with megachurch senior pastor Skip Finney. The reason? Finney has built a huge megachurch and a huge following through ever-increasing marketing antics, which involve him flying around stage in a Superman outfit. Meanwhile, Guy Sides has growing concerns that the church has become less about Jesus and the gospel and more about Skip. So he asks the question that men like Francis Chan and Jared C. Wilson are asking in real life. What about the gospel? Skip, of course, is having none of it, understanding that a marketing machine needs to be fed to make money He's on to the biggest stunt yet, an actual crucifixion on Easter Sunday. With Guy is the person who is to be nailed to the cross. They even bring in a doctor to explain how he would live through the ordeal. The movie is a glimpse into just how marketed and money-driven the church has become, and how by becoming so, the gospel and the way it calls us to live has been lost. But instead of returning to the gospel, we are often just doubling down on the worst impulses in the church to gain power and influence through self-seeking ant antics instead of the well-formed Christian life in the Trinity. We have churches filled with people who want to be entertained or comfortable, unchallenged, while well, they're mis well, mistaking manufactured spiritual highs for moves of the Holy Spirit. But when we come to the Bible, specifically the book of Acts, we're reminded that, in re that it is really not supposed to be this way. It's not supposed to be what our human frailty has made it. Even what we consider that traditional service like we have here is far from what life in the Spirit looked like for the first 500 years of the church. And that life started at Pentecost, which we looked at last Sunday. Peter preaches the first sermon, at the end of which is the call to repentance and baptism, and results in 3,000 men and women being saved. 
Then Luke gives us this summary statement of what life in the early church looked like. Now, this summary is not meant to say that the early church was a utopia. They had their issues, just like we do today. But it is meant to show us what was prioritized and teach us what we should prioritize in the church of Jesus today. The first thing that was prioritized, say that with me, prioritized, priority. The first thing that was prioritized was the teachings of the apostles. Now, we might ask what the teaching of the apostles was. Were. Well, it was the teachings of Jesus that we have handed down to us through the centuries in the Holy Word of God. Along with what the Spirit that dwelled within them showed them in guiding the growth and development of the people of God. While well, writing the New Testament, they showed how the Old Testament was fulfilled in Christ. And they did this through not they did this through preaching sermons, yes, but also through the development of creeds, like the Apostles' Creed, or the Creed in 1 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. In their society, memorization or internalization was essential, and so they expected it to be learned and repeated and internalized. And for the members to submit to the Holy Spirit using it to transform them with this and to transform them sorry and with this teaching though came signs and wonders that confirmed the teachings of the apostles and which caused the people to be in awe or fear of God the father the second priority was fellowship but not just fellowship but you need type of fellowship where they had everything in common, where no one hoarded his possessions or money or tried to use their possessions or money, or money to manipulate and control the church. They actually eliminated need. And one, day, one way they did that was by selling possessions and property and giving the proceeds to any who had need. This kind of generosity is so radically different from the culture around them as it would be today. It was one of the biggest reasons that the church grew so rapidly. They were not worried about how much money was in the bank. They met the needs of the people around them through the transformation of the Holy Spirit, living out the mission of and call and way of the Son. And when they did that, God took care of the financial side. The third thing they prioritized was eating together. Now this is part of fellowship. And this eating together would take place as they listened to the apostles' teachings in the temple, and as they met together in private homes and had needed meals together where they learned each other's needs and met them. And part of this was the Lord's Supper, which they had every single time they were together. Remembering and participating in the death and resurrection of Christ. They took this fellowship very seriously, making it part of their daily routine. And when it became disordered, as it did at Corinth. The sin was condemned and corrected in the strictest terms. See 1 Corinthians 13, or 11, actually, sorry, 11. The fourth and final thing they prioritized was the prayers. Since when they were meeting in the temple, this likely refers to the temple prayers and the prayers that Hebrew children learned from childhood such as the Moda Ani, the prayer said at waking up. I am thankful before you, my Lord, my God, for you have mercifully restored my soul within me. Great is thy faithfulness. But this would also include the types of prayers that Paul lists in 1 Timothy 2, 
one, prayers of intercession, of thanksgiving, of supplications, and the general prayers of the people. So they prioritize four things. The teachings of the apostles, that's learning and internalizing the word of God. They prioritize fellowship, radical fellowship where all the needs were taken care of and God provided. They didn't worry about the things that we often worry about. Then they prioritized eating together and the Lord's Supper, and they did this every single day. And then they prioritized the prayer. Those were the four priori priorities of the early church. And they lived this transformed life, this life in the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And the text tells us that in living this way, they had goodwill towards all the people. Now, I know most of your translations probably say that they had the favor of all the people. That is not what Luke originally wrote. That is a wrong translation. What Luke originally wrote is that they were, they had goodwill towards all the people. So they weren't just doing these things amongst themselves. They weren't just meeting the, their own needs within the body. They were also meeting the needs of outsiders, of those outside of the community. And we know they were doing this because the Emperor Julian, in the fourth century, when he tried, in the fifth century, when he tried to repaganize the emperor, wrote, These Christians care for our own sick as well as their own. Leave them alone. We need to be like them. So they had goodwill. They showed grace to all the people. And what happened? The Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. Don't miss this. They were living as the people of God, through the Holy Spirit of God, in the way and mission of the Son of God. And the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. Again, they were living as God intended, prioritizing the things that God wanted them to prioritize. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They lived life in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Lord added to their numbers daily daily those who were being saved. You see, the only early Christians understood something that we need so desperately to be reminded of. First, the message of the gospel mattered and needed to be proclaimed simply. As those God equipped to preach, the gospel taught the deeper things of the faith to everyone. Next, they understood that Jesus meant for us to live and act in a certain way that was self-sacrificing and self-giving for the sake of others. Well, God provided the resources as needed. Finally, they understood that they, as the messengers, had to be credible in light of preaching such a deeply unpopular message that the world cannot save itself. It can only be saved in Jesus. They grasped that reality. And if the gospel was going to spread, those who proclaimed it had to live a lifestyle that was attractive, that attracted the lost to Christ. They understood what Guy Sides tries to tell Skip Finney in church people. That the gospel, when proclaimed simply and lived out in a manner that shows how it can transform our lives, can attract people to Jesus, 
faster than any theatrics or any marketing campaign ever would. But the messenger had also to be credible. The church today, around this country, has a credibility problem. For instance, according to Barna, one in three people my age, that's between the age of 25 and 40, one in three who grew up in the church and have left the church say that it is because the church is extremely hypocritical. According to Gallup, in 2020, institutional trust across the board was 25%. That's institutional trust of the church as a whole. But when you took out the oldest generation, when you took out baby boomers, it dropped to just 10%. The unsaved say overwhelmingly that the church is irrelevant to their lives. And while they're open to hearing about Jesus and learning about Scripture, they do not see the church as a place that can help them with that. Further, they see Christians on social media acting worse than their unsaved friends, calling names, insulting, being abusive, bullying, and shaming victims. Young parents here, the two ladies sitting behind them in the service who talk about how the young people do not come and then turn around and condemn that same mother for wearing shorts to church. We have a credibility problem. And it exists across the board in this nation. So how do we fix it? Well, the answer is staring us in the face in our text today. We prioritize. Say that with me. Prioritize the things that the early church prioritized. And we do it as witnesses to Christ. So we prioritize the teaching of the apostles. That is the word of God. And we live the way that the Bible teaches us to live. And we do it out in the community on a daily basis. We devote ourselves to fellowship. We stop worrying about how much money is in the bank and we start living in fellowship with one another and watch God take care of the rest through his mouth. And again, we invite the community into fellowship. We meet the needs of everyone we come in contact with as God reveals. We break bread together on a regular basis, not just through the social hour after church on Sunday, but through meaningful fellowship and meals where we encourage one another in the word and we partake of the Lord's Supper together. Then we prioritize devoting ourselves to the prayers, to praying for one another instead of talking about one another, praying for our community and the people in it, and praying that God would open up the doors for us to share our faith with those around us. God is, after all, more interested in how we live and treat each other than who is right. And who is wrong? Finally, we stop worrying about the things the world worries about. Money, politics, popularity. We just live a life that is unmistakably in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We live as a people who show grace or favor to everyone we encounter, especially those who disagree with us. One day, if we do this, if we live this way, church, we will look up 
and we will see that God is added daily to our midst those who are being saved. And by the way, now that the pandemic is coming to an end, we will have greater opportunities to do just that as believers, including by the, hopefully by the end of the summer having a Monday night cookout, community cookout. But we have to do all of this. We have to prioritize these four things as a church. These four things. The teachings of the apostles, that is the word, the teaching of the word of God. The fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And we have to do this as a people who are credible when we proclaim that Jesus came and lived our life. He preached this radical third way that we see lived out by the early church here in Acts. And in doing so, he angered the religious leaders. And they conspired with the secular leaders and they killed him. He died on the cross like he said he was going to. He was buried as he said he would be and he rose again in history like he said he would. And he's ascended to God the Father. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And one day he's coming back as king and as judge. And he did all this not because he considered equality with God something to be grasped. But humbled himself to death. Even death on the cross. So that we might live in a way where our message is credible. Because our lives speak to something so much greater than us. Jesus Christ our Lord. So proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the gospel when you wake up in the morning. When you're in the market. When you're uptown having coffee. When you're in your garden, when you're on the phone, proclaim the gospel. Prioritize and let us prioritize these four things as a church. So that we might be, they might say of us, look at these Christians and how they live. It's so different from anything I have ever seen. Let's pray. Lord, help us to prioritize the things you prioritize. To make our priorities the things you put forward as our priorities. By your Holy Spirit leading your early church. Help us, Father. For we know the church in this nation, even here in our town, has a credibility problem. Help us to prioritize these four things. Especially as the pandemic ends and we can start to eat together again and be together in person again. Thank you. Help us to prioritize these four things. We love you, Lord. We ask that you be with us. Help us. Teach us by your Holy Spirit as we open up daily your scripture. And may we devo be devoted to the prayers. And live a life that, is, that attracts people to your son. We know not everyone's going to be attracted. Some will be repelled. But help us, Lord, to attract people to Jesus. Stop worrying about it. Lay off, lay aside the cares of this world and attract them, others to you. We live out a life that is in the Father, in the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. And it's in the name of the Father.
Son, and Holy Spirit, that we pray, and all of God's children said, Amen.